All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with David Hendrickson. Uh, we're in Wheeler, Oregon. It's uh, June 17, 2022. David, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for being here. Uh, first question is why wine? Why wine? I've listened to the oral history stories a couple times and knew this question was coming and still don't know the answer. <laughs> um, but I think I've always really enjoyed working with my hands. And I think when I finally got myself into wine production, um, and actually working with grapes, working with apples, working with fruit during harvest. Um, that's when it really stuck for me. And that's how I find myself here today. Perfect. So let's back up a little bit, uh, talk about kind of life before wine. So uh, where were you born and raised and uh, what was uh, sort of uh, your path out of high school? Yeah, born and raised in Oakland, California. Um, I grew up in a family that did drink wine. My parents were members at a small winery in the Sierra Foothills, so I had been around wine pretty much my entire standing life. Um, I, as a young man, went to University of Oregon, lived in Eugene for four years, um, graduated college in 2008, and without much hope of a job, uh, moved to the Portland area, worked at a farm, and then shortly after that began working at a restaurant. Um, that restaurant was Wildwood Restaurant, which was a fantastic restaurant at the time in Portland with a wonderful Oregon wine list. And just working on the floor there really afforded me the opportunity to taste amazing Oregon wines like every Saturday with the entire crew, multiple vintages, all the really quality tastings of Oregon wine. Um, with the Sommelier Savannah Ray and the Sommelier before that, Jeff Moore. Um, so yeah, that's where my really understanding and love for Oregon wine really began to build and grow, was in those days working at the restaurant. What was your first impression of Oregon wine? Um, my first impression was good. I mean, I had, I had drank wine quite a bit, but as I really got to understand Pinot and Oregon wine in general, um, yeah, it was really, I, I think I was spoiled in the fact that I got to drink a lot of really fantastic Oregon wine from the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, that was a wonderful way to enter kind of the world of wine in Oregon. And what about your sort of wine education, both formal and, in, and informal? What, how did you find yourself learning about wine? What did you find intriguing about learning about wine? Um, I do have a, a, a brief formal education in wine. <laughs> um, I, I took the, the sommelier guilds first, I, I think it's just the intro, intro class, and I passed that, but that was my only like textbook wine studying. I did not study viticulture or enology in university. I studied geography at the University of Oregon, um, and pretty much just learned by doing. I'm really, in general, I think I'm a person that learns by being involved, touching, feeling, um, and it really takes that really hands-on learner. And so it wasn't until I was like tasting, opening, seeing all the things hands-on that I really started to grasp what was going on. And when you did start to, was there something about wine that was specifically exciting for you compared to other things you might've been excited about? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was just that wine in general had so many lenses for people to, to kind of see it so many, and I was a geography nerd, still am, and I love the geography of it. I love the maps and just like the, you know, this, this wine comes from this specific parcel that was, and all the information about that, I really clung to that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and just the idea that it's obviously made, you know, once a vintage or, you know, once a year. You have one chance to make it every year during harvest. Um, it's not a recipe you can master. You don't know what it's going to look like come September, October. Um, and to make it well, you just need to really be able to, to think on your feet and do the best you can with what, what you have on the vine. So from the restaurant then, what, what was next? Um, the restaurant, I worked at the restaurant for six years until it closed. Um, and then after that, I floated around for a year or two and then finally got a harvest job with Scott Frank at Bow and Arrow. And I had met Scott and his wife Dana um, previous to working for him. And then I hadn't, I had known Dana from doing IPNC, from doing a few other charity things. Um, I didn't really know Scott. And then I ran into Dana one time 
and said, hey, I'd emailed Scott about that harvest position. He never got back to me, don't know, da 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 da. And she was just like point blank, you have a job. I will make sure that you, he's ready to have you help work on He needs it. He won't tell you he does, but he needs it. Um, and so that was in 2014. Um, I started with Scott at Bow and Arrow in 2014, and I worked there 14, 15, 16, and 17. Um, you know, 14 as an essentially untrained, limited, skilled harvest help, um, and then on up to assistant winemaker at the end of my time there. What was your first harvest like? Uh, the first harvest was fun. It was long and it was a small crew. Um, I've always loved, I guess I've always worked in really small wineries. So it's been a really hands-on experience, small, small vineyards, small lots of grapes, um, you know, small teams processing it, all hands on deck all the time. Um, but it was really fun. You really feel like you're part of something when you work in a smaller team like that. What about the work made you want to do it again? <sighs> um, I don't really know, but I loved it. And I don't really know why I loved it so much, but I did. Um, and I still love it to this day. But um, yeah, it just feels like kind of the accumulation of the whole year, of the whole growing season, of all the work you've done all year, kind of just finally comes to a head in September, October when you start picking things. And yeah, to have all hands on deck and really have that focus for a few months is, yeah, really draws me back year in, year out. So working with Scott, then tell me about what you what you learned. Obviously, you said you came in pretty green. So what did what did you learn from Scott, and what were, what was like exciting for you about kind of thinking toward the future from that? Um, yeah, it was really exciting to to get in and get a job there. He had a lot going on. Um, he had just moved into his new space in Portland, and so he was operating both a wholesale distributor, self distributing his own bow and arrow lines, and doing all the production in the basement. And so it was kind of like a three phase thing and he didn't have any, I was his first full-time employee. And so I learned a ton about kind of the entire production from farming to harvest, to seller work, to bottling season, to a labeling, to selling, to inventory, like really learned the entire breadth of essentially from grapes to bottle to sold to a, to a retailer restaurant store. Um, and really learn the ins and outs well from the beginning. And that was, I was really, really, really lucky to get in there and learn all that from, um, from him. It was a really fun working environment. You mentioned being the first employee, obviously, at a very, a very busy and growing place. So as your kind of role progressed, but by the end you're assistant winemaker. So how much were you, as assistant winemaker, kind of what was your role then? What were you doing at that point? How much were you doing? Um, yeah, it didn't seem like it didn't seem like a ton at the time, but I think we were making around three thousand cases. I make three hundred now, um, but yeah, we were doing everything in house. You know, we were bottling everything when it was ready. Um, we were labeling every. We weren't you know often able to label when we bottled, so we were labeling after the fact, um, and we were selling everything in house. Like we didn't have it. We were the own distributor in Oregon, so. We were, yeah, fulfilling deliveries every week um, for both the bow and arrow wines and for all the wines that were in the distribution portfolio. Um, so yeah, that was a great time just to get around Portland to meet buyers, other winemakers, and everybody kind of in the wine biz, especially in the city. Got my time there. What did you learn about selling wine? Oh man, <laughs> I actually, I still sell wine for a living. Um, I am a sales rep out here. And yeah, I've, I've just learned that it's really a constant, it's just, yeah, it's constant. If you stop paddling at all, you're gonna keep, you're gonna lose all the ground that you just made. So it's really just about, um, well, hey, it's about having good product and being, and being really confident and happy with what you are selling. Um, which I am and I feel really lucky to do that. 
And then it's just about building relationships. It's not about how anything tastes or even price or anything per se. It's about building human relationships um, is the most important sales. When it came to bow and arrow wines, what did you see as, what was the market for it? What was the audience for it? Um, pretty much everybody. I mean, we sold a lot of wine. We sold a lot of wine to restaurants. Scott was one of the early adopters um, to kind of planting and producing other things in the valley. You know, we had lots of Gamay and Milan and Cab Franc and Sauvignon Blanc and all these things that were, um, and he was making them really well in kind of a, I'm not going to say a modern style, but in just his new own style. And so that was really fun to be a part of, to learn, to work with those grapes. And then to just understand what it takes to um, get those wines to bottle and get them out to the market too is kind of the final step in the process. But it was a really, yeah, really fun time in my career. So what happened next? What happened next? I, uh, I just kind of worked my way through harvest there and I got to the point where I was seemingly thinking I was ready to do my own thing, um, but I also really wanted to go to Europe, so I worked the 2018 harvest in Germany um, for a small family production um, in the Falls region of Germany. And that was a really just big understanding for me. I'd never been to Europe in my life um, and went there for harvest for two months by myself. Worked in Germany, um, visited places in France and Spain, Portugal. Um, yeah, I drank a lot of cider. Um, we finished harvest early, so I actually got like the entire month of October essentially off, which I don't think I'll ever have again for the rest of my life. So that was fantastic. Um, yeah, just learned a lot. And then uh, when I came back to Oregon, moved to Tillamook County. So what was what was different about Jeremy? What what did you learn that you hadn't already learned? Germany is just such an efficient place. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing to see. And I, uh, anybody who knows me knows that I love efficiency and all the little like things you can do to be really efficient. And Germany is just the apex of that. Um, all the little gadgets they have for winemaking and just how efficient they are is mind boggling. I've never seen anything like it before. And it was just really fun to learn. Um, and this is not the case here. I spent a lot of time driving here, but all of their vineyards, they had, you know, 40 acres of vineyards that were all accessible by a tractor from their winery. Drive right downtown through a tractor, take a left here, go up to this vineyard, black check on it. And that was um, something that was just really inspiring and cool to work with. I'm curious about that side of things, the vineyard side of things. You mentioned that that was part, of, kind of part of what Scott was working on and part of the role. But you're working in an urban winery there, so tell me what the difference is like being in a place like where the vineyards are all around you like that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was amazing to be that close to the, to be that close to all the vineyards. You could check on them, you know, every day. Whereas there's so many benefits to being an urban winery in that you have the market so close and you can welcome people into your space um, and your commute to your home is so short and nice. Um, but there is a bit of a distance to some of the vineyards, but it's, it's part of working it that you just have to drive an hour or two, you know, every week, multiple times a week to check on things, to meet all the farmers, to make sure things are on track. After, after my time in the city, I just came to the point where I think I really just wanted to go surfing more, but I was really excited to get out of the city um, and onto the coast, onto somewhere that has a bit more space and land. So how did you choose this place? I mean, being honest, I really just chose it to go surfing every day. <laughs> um, but I have loved it out here for a long time. Um, I, have a lot, I had a lot of friends that lived in Tillamook County, um, in the South County, and in the Manzanita area as well. Um, and so, yeah, I just took a stab and moved out here. I got lucky when I got this house, and uh, yeah, I've really been loving it ever since. You mentioned surfing, obviously another another passion. Just tell us about sort of how that's developed over time. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a journey. I was formerly used to shape surfboards, so I think that was something that really. Um, I grew up in California, surfed quite a bit in middle school, kind of lost it when I originally moved to Oregon, um, and then picked it back up actually living in Portland. 
a roommate at the time was a really avid surfer, and so we'd go out surfing every week. Um, after time, it got apparent that I was really <laughs> into and addicted to it, surfing pretty much every week, driving from Portland, um, but had never lived at the beach. And then finally kind of had my chance to move out to the beach, and yeah, I've been thrilled about it ever since. So when you moved out here, did you have, what was your wine plan? I didn't have a huge wine plan. Um, 2018, 2019 was a time in my life where I didn't have a ton of plans. It felt really good and free <laughs> to not have these like big plans or anything holding me back. I didn't have, um, so when I moved out here, I just kind of took my sales jobs and began this new sales territory out here. So I've been selling wine from Tillamook to Astoria. Um, for PDX, and this was a territory that they had never been in before. So it's been really fun to introduce the community, the restaurants, the shops out here to these new wines, many of which from Oregon, many of which from Europe. Um, and then I also went, I'd said I would never work at a restaurant again. 2019, I did go back to working at a restaurant across the street from here, the Salmon Berry, um, which is a fantastic restaurant here on the North Coast. Um, and I kind of helped them get some of their wine program off the ground and more accessible to people. So you mentioned, obviously, you mentioned earlier kind of how you sell wine. I'm, I'm curious about building a wine program. How, how do you sort of approach that? How do you, how do you approach helping someone set it up? Um, you know, the price of everything has just gone up so much in the last in the last five to 10 years, and especially in the last year. Um, I've always really focused on having drinkable, approachable wines um, as kind of my number, my most important criteria to wine. I love geeky wines and, and wines that you really have to like dig into to figure out, but I also just love wines that are approachable and drinkable. And it's always, you know, it's always kind of the best sign of a wine is when somebody can drink it quickly, happily, and you know, ask ask for more beyond that, as opposed to something that's, you know, you might not want to have more than a half glass of, or, <laughs> um, and something that just goes well with food. Something that you can share at the table with friends, with family, with food. So you mentioned 2018, 2019 is kind of a time when there wasn't a whole lot of plan. Uh, so what point does the plan start to change a little bit? Um, yeah, the plan really started to change when. I got, well, I guess I'll go back. I, in 2019, I actually didn't really work. I didn't work a harvest for the first time in six years. Um, I'd worked in Europe the year before and was kind of free in September, October. It was this weird feeling of like, I was gonna help some friends. I helped out here and there with friends just for a week or two. Um, but then got with some other friends and rented an apple press from Steinbart's, just the brewing supply store, rented this tiny little apple press and went and just picked kind of feral random apples. I have a big apple tree there. My neighbor has a big apple tree and just picked basically a pickup truck full of apples. Um, took it to this little tiny Corel press, which is this fantastic little press company made outside of Eugene. It has a little grinder and a press in one. Um, and we just had a little press party. Pressed like I think like, I don't know, maybe a hundred liters of cider or something like that, which is a pretty good, you know, more than I think an average homemaker would make, but not, you know, not production level. Um, and it turned out really, really, really good. I kind of used most of what I, I think of as white wine making techniques um, in the cider. And it turned out fantastic. And then in 2020, when I moved into here, um, yeah, pretty much built this whole space as just a really rustic, minimalist, one-person winery. So you, we've seen your apples, for one of your uh, ciders described as feral and foraged. I, I like that term. So tell me <laughs> about how the apples, the well, it's always ciders first, how the cider making has sort of progressed. Yeah. Um, I guess when I traveled to Europe, I drank a lot of cider in Basque Country, in Asturias, um, and I've always, I've actually always loved cider. I've always loved apples in general too, and Oregon just is such an amazing place to grow apples. Um, from the coast, to the mountains, to the gorge, to the valley, I mean everywhere in Oregon you can grow fantastic apples. Um, 
And it was always wild to me that so many would fall on the ground, that people would have trees, people would have so many trees and they like seemingly would not pick any of them. Um, and so, yeah, we just, I kind of started going around people that I knew that had apple trees and just talking them up, finding these kind of feral old homestead apples, finding apples in old public land. Um, pretty much anywhere I could. I tried to avoid roadsides because most of them are sprayed, railroad tracks because they're all sprayed. Um, but anything that hasn't been sprayed, um, yeah, just picking and tasting and figuring out if we think we can make good cider out of it. And what about selling cider? Is it different? It is seemingly different, but at the same time, it's um, it's really drinkable and it's a, like a really growing category um, in Oregon. I'm, I'm truthfully really surprised that there's not more makers of cider in Oregon on the smaller scale. Um, I'm sure there will be soon. There are some fantastic ones already, but I'm sure there will be a multitude more soon. Um, yeah, it's, it's been quite easy to sell. I mean, I've, I've sold most of it just here locally on the coast. I do the farmer's market in Manzanita every Friday, um, going into our fourth rainy June market in a row tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, I sell most of it here along the coast and then do some sales trips to Portland, um, to the valley, et cetera. And what, and what about wine? How does wine fit into your sort of current plans? Wine? I want wine to be in my current plans, but I haven't found, I haven't found the grapes. I just haven't found the kind of the perfect fit for it at this point in my, um, my own venture here is still incredibly young and tiny and I barely have room for enough apples in there, let alone more wine. So I'm, I'm putting it on hold for a little while. Um, all the wine grapes that I've used have gone into kind of co-fermented with apples and cider. Um, so I have, you know, I have processed some Pinot, some Chardonnay, some Pinot Gris, but they've all gone into a co-fermented bottling with mostly apples. So tell me about the, then as you kind of, as you look ahead then, what, what do you kind of hope this becomes? I don't really, I don't really know. I mean, I'd like to move, I'd like to move to a facility. I'd like to move to my own facility that is, um, that is built for larger production than I currently have space for. Um, I'm gonna do about 400 cases out of here this year, 2021, 2022. I'm gonna try to get up, push it to the absolute limit at like 500 cases. Um, but that will be like floor to ceiling packed. Um, but I'd like to get to a space where I can have some, have some trees and have some land, um, get more apple trees in the ground, get some grapes in the ground. Um, and have just kind of a larger production space to, to fit those things in together. So if you were to do that, what would you like to grow in terms of both apples and in terms of grapes? I mean, I just love apples so much. I really just want to grow lots and lots of apples. Um, but grapes, I've always been interested in, um, especially more recently in hybrid grapes. Um, out here, finding some, finding some grape varieties that are really moisture tolerant, really mildew resistant, um, a little bit shorter growing season. Um, you know, we're right kind of on the coast here, but if you go about 10 miles in, you've got a whole different climate that I believe is dry enough to, to grow some grapes, probably not Vitis vinifera grapes, but certainly hybrids. Um, and so, yeah, really experimenting and planting those, I think, I think Pinot Noir, I think Oregon Pinot Noir is amazing, but I think it is, I think there's enough fantastic makers of it that I don't necessarily want to throw my hat, throw my name in that hat. Um, but I'm really grateful that there are so many people making fantastic Pinot and other things in the Valley. I'm just, I'm kind of happy with apples at the moment <laughs> or happier than I even thought I'd be. So with that, with that, since apples are such a kind of the, the thing at the moment, do you have like a, a size you'd like to be? Do you have like a, do you have a scale in mind? Yeah, I think I'd like to get up to the thousand, thousand case realm. Um, you know, I currently self-distribute everything myself just in Oregon, so I'm not in any other states. Um, but 
I'm a, you know, I'm a one-man operation. I'd like to get to the point where I could hire one or two other people to really teach them, you know, teach them some production stuff. I'd like the opportunity to teach somebody who hadn't been to formal training for wine or cider um, and to really teach them from a younger green age. Mm -hmm. um, like I was taught, like Scott was taught. Um, I think that would be a fantastic opportunity. I'd like to work towards that. Um, and yeah, there, I'd just like to, to be on a, a scale that's really manageable for my size. I don't want to, I don't dream of being too large or being in Safeway or doing anything like that. I want to keep it as a really artisan, small scale production. You mentioned earlier that you're, you kind of, you, you applied sort of what you thought were wine, wine, white wine making techniques to making cider. Has your style changed? Has your kind of, have your techniques changed? Um, no, I kind of stick to the, the classic techniques, but I, um, I've got seven barrels in there, so I'm doing a lot of barrel fermented ciders, um, two big stainless tanks. Um, apples are amazing in the fact that you don't necessarily have to press them the day they're picked. They're actually, many apples are quite better after they sit for two to four weeks. So you can kind of have, you can kind of juggle things and really wine grapes, you need to, you need to press them that day. Oftentimes they need to be picked early before the sun is on them and then they need to be you know pressed or put into hand you know put into the winery and put away you know before noon but apples are amazing in the fact that they can last for weeks at a time so you can kind of have some time to organize your press schedule and what's going you know organize your blends before you even put them into tank or barrel um, and that's been really fun to do out here So tell us about uh, 2020 from your perspective. Uh, what was what was the year like for you, and what were the sort of uh, adjustments or uh, changes that you made or had to make to get through? Yeah, 2020 was just a just a wild time. Um, I was really really grateful to be living out here, to be living in a in a rural place, to be living a mile from the beach, um, to be living less than a mile from just wild areas, the forest, the river, kind of everywhere that I could go by myself on my bike and by myself to go surf in the middle of the ocean with nobody else around. And I was really lucky to, to be out here during that. I feel like, I think I would have gone, it would have been really difficult for me to process the whole thing in the city. I don't have, I have a partner, I don't have a family, I don't have children or anything like that. So um, it was actually a really free time for me out here and the fact that it was not crowded, like nature really got to make a huge comeback in those, that spring of when everything was shut down, there was, you know, there was bears and bobcats and elk on the beach and they had kind of like took back this area as theirs, as there weren't so many people around. Um, and that was really amazing to see. From the other part of your job, obviously you're selling wine. Uh, what was that like for you in 2020? How did the, how how did you how did you sort of see the industry aff affected in 2020? Yeah, um, yeah, it was really hard. As a as a you know as a sales rep, we shut down for we shut down to figure it out, figure things out for a month or so. Um, but then you know business and grocery just got was. All, you know, the business of the restaurant went to zero. Everything, everything stopped there, but the business in grocery stores just went gangbusters through the roof like it had never, we had never seen before. And so it was really a pivot for a lot of small producers in Oregon and distributors to get these wines at a grocery store price point and get lots of them there in kind of any means necessary. It was. Yeah, the average price of bottle went down, but the sales went way, 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 way up. Um, and it's still kind of skewed that way, but it's, it's really nice to see restaurants kind of back up and running in some capacity, small retail shops up and running in some capacity. Um, yeah. Are there are there changes from the past couple of years that you think are going from in terms of that market that are going to stay? Um, yeah, I do. I think it's. I mean, it, it'll forever change. 
it'll forever change the world in a lot of the ways we live, not to mention sell wine and drink wine. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's just really changed. The, the pricing has changed a lot in kind of what the customer wants for pricing and where they want to shop. Um, I think a lot of people have moved into supporting these kind of small wine shops as a way to help them kind of survive the last couple years. And I hope that that continues for all the small producers of wine in Oregon. Um, and then I really hope that restaurants are able to, restaurants, wineries in general, events are able to really welcome some people back um, just to kind of tell the story and share wine with friends. That's what we've really all been missing. So you talked about your initial impressions of Oregon wine. What are the changes you've seen to the industry in your time sort of in it and around it and, and, and taking a look at it? Um, I think as a whole, it's just, it's amazing how many small producers um, in Oregon in general for the whole United States is really kind of at the forefront of planting so many new varieties, um, both in the valley and in the gorge, um, in eastern Oregon, southern Oregon. Um, and then I think a lot of people are really transitioning to quality organic farming, um, some regenerative farming. I think Oregon is just really leading the way um, as we kind of move into this new climate world of, of grapes where California is seemingly like possibly not fit to grow grapes for very much longer <laughs> or many areas in California. There's still plenty of areas that should be able to, but um, the same goes for Washington too. Like water is, water is going to become an issue. Heat is going to become an issue. Um, you know, larger storms, wet springs are all going to become an issue. And I think Oregon is, yeah, is placed to do well as that, as that happens, hopefully. <laughs> can help. So then with that said, what do you see as you look ahead for the Oregon wine industry and, and specifically in your case, uh, what role does cider play in that? Cider to me just seemed, um, the apple is just such a resilient fruit. It is just amazing how resilient it is. It takes absolutely nothing to grow. Like there's just a small orchard of apples sitting below us just from seeds from last year. Like they'll just pop up in the gravel in the road and a tree will literally sprout out of there. Um, they require no irrigation. They require little to no pruning or management. Um, and they can bear immense amounts of fruit if, if taken care of and in healthy soil. Um, you know, grapes do require um, a ton of agricultural input in order to get from the vineyard to the bottle. Um, there's a ton of man hours, a ton of field work, you know, potentially tilling, tractor work, leaf pulling, shoot thinning, shoot positioning, harvests. Um, and it's gonna be a challenge for the Oregon wine industry moving forward to really take on all the labor that goes into that, um, all the man hours that go into that. Um, and apples have just seemed like an overlooked, like they require less of you than grapes do. And that's something that I just have really loved about them in the last few years. With that said, what is the, you talk, we talked about a little bit about sales. Uh, when it comes to cider sales, where do they sort of, how do they align with wine sales? Is it, is it uh, in terms of sort of margin, in terms of audience? What, what does it look like right now? Yeah. Um, it looks good. People are drinking cider, um, even though it's, even though it's a bit gray out. Um, and some people think of it as a summer, you know, as a real summer drink, um, people are drinking it. There's a, um, there's so many kind of natural wines that are less, um, less in the traditional production, more kind of wild and free and cloudy and sparkling and apples really fit into that. You know, their chemistry is very similar to grapes. Um, when pressed, they have very similar pHs. Obviously, they contain less sugar than grapes. Um, but I think apples can just make such a drinkable beverage and cider. And yeah, they're, they're just really abundant in Oregon. And 
it's been fun to work with. And I think the market has really embraced that as there's there's just a large gap between kind of factory produced cider and really small production cider here in Oregon. So what advice or words of wisdom would you have for someone who wanted to enter the Oregon wine or Oregon cider industry? My advice would be to, yeah, really stay true and honest to making, uh, to making a good product and a commitment to quality farming and quality products. Um, I think we see so much so many wineries with like uh, marketing budgets and all this and that, but if you just make a, you know, a humble product that's, that's grown well, that's farmed well, um, and you know, you treat it well and you're proud of it, I think that it will, it will fit in the market somewhere. And I think, uh, I think you can hang your hat on that. I realize we've gotten to this point in the interview and I haven't actually asked you the name of your project. So tell us the name of your project yeah. and why it's named that and uh, tell us uh, anything else about sort of the future of it. Yeah. Um, well, it is Carla Wines. I can sort it out here just because everybody calls it Carola, but it is actually pronounced Carla. Um, it's a Swedish spelling of the word Carla. It was my mother's name. Um, and so, yeah, my winery and project is named after her. Um, I've, I have a winery license for my project since I do actually make cider from real apples that are harvested in season. Um, I had no idea, but most producers of cider do not harvest apples in season and make them as a winery and you do not need a winery license for that. So I have a winery license um, and I do intend to make wine from grapes at some point, but at this point sticking to apples and fruit wine. All right. That's all the questions that I have for you. Uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here that we needed to cover? No, I don't think so. I feel like we blazed through that really <laughs> fast. But um, Some people are very efficient when they tell their story. Yeah. No, I don't think I'm a huge talker, so I think that's all. I feel bad making you drive all the way up here for a quick conversation, <laughs> but... No, no worries at all. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your stories with us and for telling it to stay dry while we were sitting out here. It was very nice of you to do that. Yeah. I'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Thank you so much. Thank you.